Good morning. Beautiful day, isn't it? Uh, Jory and I and our uh, Cam, Jamie, and Erica went to Cannon Beach yesterday. I don't think I've ever seen it so clear and uh, so uh, beautiful. Uh, David Christian, in his presentation, The History of Our World in 18 Minutes, uh, shares this video of a, a scrambled egg. Yes, it is a scrambled egg. But as you look at it, I hope you'll begin to feel just slightly uneasy. Because you may notice that what's actually happening is that the egg is unscrambling itself. And you will now see the yolk and the white have separated, and now they're going to be poured back into the egg. And we all know in our heart of hearts that this is not the way the universe works. A scrambled egg is mush, tasty mush, but it's mush. An egg is a beautiful, sophisticated thing that can create even more sophisticated things, such as chickens. And we know in our heart of hearts that the universe does not travel from mush to complexity. In, in fact, this gut instinct is reflected in one of the most fundamental laws of physics, the second law of thermodynamics, or the law of entropy. What that says, basically, is that the general tendency of the universe is to move from order and structure to lack of order, lack of structure, in fact, to mush. And that's why that video feels a bit strange. So it is a little weird for an egg to be unscrambling because we know that's not the way things work. Now, the second law of thermodynamics says the world is winding down. It's turning to mush. Things are getting worse. And that's exactly the point the Apostle Paul makes in the first three chapters of Romans. He says we can all know there's a God by looking outside and seeing how beautiful it is and how wonderfully things work. But we ignore God, we reject God, and when we do, we uh, make things worse in the world. He says we can all know there's a God by the fact that all human beings worldwide tend to judge other people. You judge other people, I do. It shows that we understand the difference between right and wrong. But we don't do right, we do wrong, and the world gets worse. He says even religious people who have the Old Testament and the New Testament, they know God's will for their lives, but they don't do it, and things get worse in the world. This is the sixth in our series of messages, Christianity 101. We're trying to talk about what is the Christian faith. And today we start at Romans chapter 3, verse 21. You can open your Bible if you have one. If you'd like to use the Bibles we have under the seats, it's on page 1,129. If you're not a Christian, you could not have picked a more perfect week to attend. I'm going to explain the heart of what Christian faith entails. Teenager, young single, married, empty nester. Today I will try to share, share the central point of the Christian faith. Uh, this will help you know how to explain the faith to a friend or your parent or your child. Paul begins with the words, but now. Uh, these are two of the sweetest words, words in all the Bible. Paul has been talking about the fact that we all have sinned. We fall short of God's glory. We are all guilty. Our consciences condemn us. We've made a mess of the world and things get worse. But now, now he introduces us to God's grace. He introduces us to Christ's death on the cross for our sins. This may be possibly the most important single paragraph ever written. Paul says, we are made right with God by grace through faith. Parents, talk about this with your kids. It's easy for you and your kids to live as if we're trying to earn our way into God's favor. Paul answers three great questions in this text. I want to answer these questions and then make three observations. Question number one, how can a, be, how can a person be assured of entering heaven? How can we be made righteous so that we can enter into God's presence in heaven? Paul's readers wondered if living a moral life 
Obeying the law, being circumcised, does not lead to salvation. How can a person be made right with God? Martin Luther asked, if I smite my body 150 times so that I can be accepted by God, how can I know that he won't require 151 times? One solution is to lower God's standards. We lower God's standards so that we maybe can enter into, God, into heaven. Uh, the irony is that as I reduce the toughness of God's standards, as many mainline churches are doing today, I also reduce Christianity's appeal. Suppose a football coach says to players as they gather, this year we're going to have a lot of fun. Come to practice if you can. Uh, game night, show up about 20 minutes before the game. Uh, we're only going to learn a few plays this year. Make it easy. Well, they might have a fun year, but they're also going to have a losing year. And in the process, most of the players are going to drop off the team. He's reduced the game's appeal. So how can we be made right with God? Paul answers, read this with me. We are made right with God by grace through faith. Verse 21 but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. Paul makes clear from the outset that getting right with God is not about earning your way into God's favor. He proceeds to state the biblical uh, doctrine of justification. Verse 21. But now a righteousness of God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. No difference between Jew and Gentile for, famous verse, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. What is justification? Justification is the act, the sovereign act of God, whereby he declares righteous, believing sinners, while we are still sinners. Justification is to pronounce righteous, not to make righteous. In justification, we're made right with God instantly. The process of becoming righteous takes time. That's called sanctification. He grants us this by his gift of grace, simply because he loves us. When Martin Luther understood this passage, he realized there's no need for this uh, 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 teaching about purgatory anymore. Purgatory uh, came about by, by, by people realizing we can't be righteous enough to earn our way into God's presence, and so we need a place where we can work off our sins, purge ourselves. And uh, in the 10th century, uh, and, and, and Luther also realized that the, the, the teaching, the, Bible, the, the church's teaching about indulgences was just not, not necessary. In the 10th century, uh, people would go to uh, um, uh, the Middle East, uh, Israel, uh, to, uh, to, to redeem it from the uh, Turks. Or if they couldn't go, they'd pay money, indulgences, so that other people could go. Or they give money for St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, all to work off their sins. Then came the diet of worms. You may have tried a diet. This one will work, guaranteed. In 1521, Luther stood before the council at Worms and stated that he was opposed to indulgences and the teaching about purgatory. He stood on the authority of Scripture and said, we're saved by grace through faith alone. The Protestant Reformation was built on this uh, doctrine of justification by grace through faith. The apostle uses some metaphors to kind of elucidate uh, this doctrine. One is the court. We're familiar with the courtroom. The judge is God. Uh, the defendant is humankind, all of us. Uh, the verdict is that we're guilty. Uh, the penalty is that we deserve to uh, die physically and spiritually. Uh, then God sent his son to pay the penalty for us. Christ died in our place so that we could be pardoned. Another metaphor he uses is the slave market. He uses the Greek word apolutrosis, which means redemption. 
Uh, the word is used almost exclusively for uh, redeeming a slave from the slave market. So Paul's point is that God redeemed us from slavery to sin so that we could become servants of God. Uh, we, we estimate that when this Romans was written, one in three citizens in Rome were slaves. Uh, we know as a fact that the church used much of their benevolence money to buy slaves out of slavery. Why they do this? Because we believe that God bought us through Christ's death out of slavery to sin. Another metaphor he uses is the temple. Verse 25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Once a year, the Jewish priests would offer sacri blood sacrifice for atone for the people's sins. And Paul says, Jesus is the Lamb of God, the atoning sacrifice for all people's sins of all time. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, verse 25, because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. God overlooked sins beforehand, seeing, knowing that he was sending his son to die in our place. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. This doesn't mean we'll never sin, but that our pardon is secure. Question number two, does justification by grace through faith nullify the law? Paul's readers wondered, since salvation comes through faith, not by keeping the law, does this nullify the need for the law? Paul answers in verse 31, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Paul answers no. We still need the law. The law is not a way to, uh, to earn our way into heaven, but it shows us how far we fall short of God's standard. No one can perfectly keep the law, but we need the law to show us God's standard and how far we fall short, how much we've messed up. I told you last week that during the NBA season, one of my favorite shows is Inside the NBA. Uh, Charles Barkley... Kenny Smith, Ernie Johnson, and Shaquille O'Neal, hands down the best commentators on the NBA in the business. And uh, the reason the show is good is because they, they don't have a script. They just kind of, they don't tell each other what they're going to say. They ad lib. They make jokes about each other. It's very freewheeling. And uh, so uh, one of their funniest ones was uh, when Kenny Smith's wife had a baby. And so he missed a few games. And when he came back, he was talking about, you know, seeing the baby born and how he helped change diapers. And Charles says to him, I bet you didn't change one diaper. See, yeah, I did. I changed all kinds of diapers. So Ernie Johnson, just on the spot, had, had, he says, let's, so during the break, he went out and he says, let's have a, a diaper changing contest between Charles and Kenny. So the staff rushed out to buy a couple dolls and, and some diapers. And just to keep it real. They melted a chocolate bar into Charles Barkley's baby doll's diaper. So watch this. Yeah. Uh, so. Well, I can't do this. You know why? Why? Because it doesn't. You don't have a receiving blanket. Or do, what? I don't want to oh, hear about receiving oh, blankets. I'm up, baby. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You got a receiving. You can't just and pick up a baby. With that. I don't have any hand sanitizer. Uh, you're cool with the, with the whole arrangement here, right, Charles? This is good for you. Wait. Yeah. Huh? See, this is the first thing you should do, Chuck. You should wash your dirty hands before you touch a clean baby. Okay. It's crap in here. <laughs> My hands got cleaner than crap. Are you are you guys prepared? Do we have a do we have a clock? Ready. On your mark. You gotta do it the right way though. Yeah, you both well, I'll be the judge. Okay. On your mark, get set, go. Do 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 do. Go. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Charles. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Good job, Jay. Oh my god. 
So you got away from back to front as a girl. You didn't even what? clean the bed. <laughs> oh, just, there you all go. You, all uh, you did. <laughs> all you did. All you did. I like how Charles didn't even clean the baby, just put the diaper on. Like the baby's diaper, we've all messed up. Christ's death on the cross doesn't have any significance unless we understand how much we've messed up. That's why Paul takes three chapters to show us that we've made a mess of things. We fall short of God's standards and we're all in crisis. We need the law to show us, read this with me, we are made right with God by grace through faith. Question number three, is justification by grace through faith a departure from Old Testament teaching? A Paul's teaching that uh, we are saved by grace through faith came as a surprise to most Jews. They thought we were saved by keeping the law. So many concluded that Christianity was a sect that departed from the Old Testament. So Paul shows them that no, grace by faith was there all along in the Old Testament. Paul answers, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made, made known to which the law and the prophets testify. He says the Old Testament, they testify about this. The good news that we get right standing with God, not from the law, was taught in the Old Testament. To prove his point, he talks about Abraham. What a perfect example. Abraham is the father of the Hebrew nation. Most of the Jews assumed that Abraham was justified by his works. Paul says, no. What then shall we say? This is chapter 4, verse 1. That Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter, if, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What's the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. It was Abraham's faith that brought him right standing before God. Then Paul addresses Abraham's circumcision, a practice that the Jews assume gave them right standing with God. Paul argues that uh, Abraham was reckoned right with God, not by his circumcision, but by his faith. This is chapter 4, verse 9. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. Uh, Abraham believed God 14 years before he was circumcised, so it couldn't possibly have been his circumcision that made him right with God. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. Uh, Paul makes another point about Abraham. Abraham was not justified before God by adherence to the law. This is verse 13. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. Abraham lived 400 years before God gave the law to Moses, so Abraham couldn't possibly have been justified by the law keeping it. Verse 18, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. God came to Abraham and said, you're going to be a father of many nations. I'm going to give you and Sarah a son. So Abraham's like 100 years old. Sarah's like 90. So he comes to Sarah one day and says, Sarah, God said we're going to have a son. And Sarah says, Abe, don't joke with me. How can that be? Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. He believed that God could do it, even though they were old but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. So justification by faith is not a departure from Old Testament teaching, 
No one was ever justified by keeping the law. Both Old and New Testament teach, here we go again, read it with me, we are made right with God by grace through faith. In Genesis 15, God promised Abraham that he and Sarah were, that they were going to have a son. Then Abraham and Sarah experienced a long wait. From a human perspective, it, it seems almost cruel. But the Lord used the delay to do, accomplish two important purposes. He wanted the Hebrew people to see that the, the whole thing of salvation was supernatural from beginning to end. He also wanted to develop Abraham and Sarah's faith. Now, I want to make three observations. First, the doctrine of sin softens our heart. Paul takes three chapters to make the point that no one is righteous before God. All of us have sinned. The doctrine that we've all sinned is a good doctrine. It puts us all on the same level. It's very democratic. It says we're all in this together. No one has an edge with God. We're all sinners. We all have a common problem. It equalizes us before God. If you were to raise a child and work your fingers to the bone to put your child through college, and then your son or daughter graduates and never gives you the time of day, never talks to you, that would be wrong. Your child owes you respect and love. Well, when it comes to God, when we realize that he loves us, all he has done for us, sending his son for us, for us to reject him and want nothing to do with him is infinitely worse. If you believe that, you realize how much you've wronged God. It softens your heart. Second, the source of our justification is God and his grace. Since we're all sinners, none of us can claim that we get to God by our own efforts. It's God who saves us. God the Father is the one who initiated this whole thing. The doctrine of justification brings glory to the Father. It can never bring glory to the sinner. God gets the glory. Third, justification is available to all who believe. Verse 29 of chapter 3, Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there's only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith. Now verse 22, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Since sin involves all humankind, the solution must be for all humankind. As all men and women are in crisis, in sin, then all of us are made equal not only in our sin, but at the cross of Christ. It's the same way all of us can get to God. It's a free gift. No one's excluded. All people around the world are invited to know God through Christ's death on the cross. No one's excluded because it's a free gift. Anyone can qualify. I think you'll be surprised at some of the people you'll find in heaven. Some will be surprised to find you in heaven. You get there by putting your faith in Christ. Satan's at work right now saying, to attend, experience God, family night, uh, starting point, that'll be in three weeks, class I teach, and it's kind of like starting point. How do I get started with Christ? What do I do? How do I go further with him? Uh, it's for uh, also for people that say, you know, I like this church and I want to, I want to, uh, you know, commit to, to being part of this church. A discussion with Dr. Bart Rask, April 29th. I, he's going to be talking about, is there science that disputes a creator God? And he, he is great. Chris, uh, Chris and I will be asking him questions and uh, 
um, I think it'll be a great night. But uh, we're going to have a, uh, it's going to be 5.30 to 6.30, but uh, there, w there will be dinner served 5 to 5.30, and we want to know how many is for dinner. So check that if you want to come uh, for dinner. And then last, there's a green sheet in here. This is a list of community groups. We have 13 in our church, and we'd love for you to be part of one of those. If you see one here that you say, that would that would fit me. I, 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 uh, it's a good location, uh, good good time of the week. Uh, check that, and the, uh, the leader uh, will uh, contact you. Or at the top, it says, gather a group for Pastor Ron's five-week series. Uh, we're doing... Uh, uh, Mike and I are doing eight to ten minute videos each week and uh, you know some teaching from me and uh, you can you say I'll, I'll gather a group I've got you know some friends at school or friends at work uh, I'd say, you, know, you say hey my pastor's doing a series on supernatural power would you like to do that with me or maybe it's your family you want to gather or just some friends and um, uh, so uh, if you Put your name on this and drop it in the, and you've got to give us your email because that's how we're going to send you the link to the, uh, uh, the little video. Uh, and then you can, uh, you can have that as well. So drop this in the offering and love to have you uh, uh, be a group for, for that series. At this time, we're going to take our morning offering. But we want to emphasize that if you're a guest with us today, we're not asking for you to give. This is something we do as a church family each week as an act of worship. But we would appreciate your communication card, your prayer requests. We do pray over those. Uh, but if you did come prepared to give, uh, the men will come around uh, with the baskets. Thanks. Let's pray the Lord. We thank you that we have this opportunity to respond to you. Lord, that we have heard this gospel. Lord, that we have heard the proofs, the understand, the understanding that Christ indeed died for our sins, died in our place, and rose again on the third day, and is now seated at your right hand, interceding for us even now. May our life, every aspect of it, praiseworthy for your name, bring glory to you, our Savior. We thank you and we say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Because upon him, 